when we're comparing attending a gay wedding to things that don't matter, a ritual event that celebrates what God regards as egregious sin, where the participants actually vow to continue in the immorality lifelong, uh, that's no more a place for a Christian, faithful Christian, to be present at than it is for a faithful Christian to be present at an idol's temple. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Robert Gagnon. I've been wanting him to come on the show for a long time. And he recently wrote an article uh, about attending gay weddings. And the title of the article is, Is it loving for a faithful Christian to go to a gay wedding? And uh, it's a very, very helpful article. Um, and we're going to post it below. And Robert Gagnon, he's he wrote this book, The Bible and Homosexual Practice, which is an amazing academic book. Uh, it's super thorough. He goes into the Greek, the Hebrew, uh, the an antiquity, culture and antiquity. And um, it's it's so, so well written, so uh, helpful if you want to if you want a really thorough book on what the Bible has to say about homosexuality, please get this. And Robert Gagnon is a professor of, theolo of theology at Houston Christian University. He has his BA from Dartmouth. He has his uh, master's of theological studies from Harvard Divinity School. And he has his PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. So please welcome Dr. Robert Gagnon. Thank you. It's great to be here, Beckett. So glad to have you on. Um, I want to talk about your recent article you wrote for Christ Overall. And the title of the article is, Is it loving for a faithful Christian to go to a gay wedding? Now, this is a perennial question. And uh, you get into, it's, I, it's fascinating what uh, how you relate this, the analogy you use. But first, let's talk about uh, because some people say this is a Romans 14 issue. So remind us what Romans 14 is about and, and, and then talk about how this is not a Romans 14 issue. So in Romans 14, Paul deals with two groups, the strong and the weak. Um, the weak are so-called because they hold false scruples about things that they need not scruple. And in this particular case, it happens to do with diet and in particular, whether they can eat meat. So they abstain from meat. There's various reasons for that. There's some movements in early Judaism abstaining from meat. We even see an element of this in Daniel 1, for example, where rich food beats the passions of the flesh, that sort of thing. So abstaining from meat can involve that. It can also involve concerns about tainting with idolatry and so forth. At any rate, for whatever reason, they're abstaining from meat. And they need not, in Paul's opinion, and the strong are urging them to eat meat. So it's similar in some respects to the situation in 1 Corinthians 8, although it doesn't have uh, restrictions just to questions of idolatry. It's more general than that. And, and, and they're arguing with each other over this issue. So the, the strong are looking down on the weak and uh, the, the, the strong who believe they can eat all things and the weak are judging the strong. Paul wants them both to stop. In effect, he's saying, mind your own business. The kingdom of God does not consist of food and drink, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit, with the emphasis being on righteous conduct. And what Paul is saying, whether a person eats meat or doesn't eat meat, will have no bearing, ultimate bearing, on their relationship to Jesus Christ and their inheritance of the kingdom of God. So stop arguing, mind your own business, celebrate the glorious things that Christ has done for you and become united. Don't become divided over what should be considered matters of indifference, things that don't matter. Mm -hmm. So when we're comparing 
attending a gay wedding to things that don't matter, a ritual event that celebrates what God regards as egregious sin, where the participants actually vow to continue in the immorality lifelong, uh, that's no more a place for a Christian, faithful Christian, to be present at than it is for a faithful Christian to be present at an idol's temple. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that later on. So uh, it's not, it really begs the question to one extent <laughs> to say, um, you know, we don't really know um, what Paul's view would be on this. Well, actually, we do know quite clearly. Um, but getting married in an immor to a, a person that makes it an immoral sexual union intrinsically is not a matter of indifference. It is a matter that matters. And uh, that's why I bring up the particular analogy that I do from 1 Corinthians 5, but I don't want to jump ahead of things to where you want to go. Yeah. So in 1 Corinthians 5, you give the analogy of attending an incestuous wedding. So how talk about that analogy and why you make that analogy. Just before I do, I, I want to uh, also um, say something about the fact that I'm surprised about how much slippage there is in the church on the question of attending a gay wedding. So in the article, I, I mentioned the uh, president and uh, executive of Christianity Today, um, who actually attended a gay wedding, flew down to Mexico for one. Uh, I, I mentioned also uh, even focus on the family. Mm -hmm. Says it's a Romans 14 issue. Now, they're a little more cautious than the other ones that I mentioned, but uh, but they still essentially say it isn't anything that we have clear indication from Scripture what we ought to be doing. And you could do one or the other, although they're cautious about attending. Um, and um, and others, Andy Stanley's probably gone over even on the whole question of homosexuality on homosexual practice, let alone attending um, a gay wedding. Preston Sprinkle uh, actually recommends that if a family member is going to get married in a gay wedding, you should attend uh, so that you don't alienate them. That raises all sorts of problems, which we could also discuss later. Right. I mentioned the issue of incest as the best analog. It's not the issue of remarriage after divorce. It's the issue of incest that's the best analog. And there are several reasons for that. The degree of the severity of the offense, only an incestuous relationship in Paul's understanding and the understanding of scripture generally approaches the degree of severity of a homosexual or gay wedding. Secondly, the reason for the prohibition of both homosexual practice and incest is similar. Essentially, it's having a sexual union with somebody who is already too much oneself, uh, a sort of uber sameness among the participants. In the case of incest, the sameness is on the level of kinship. Uh, you're already too much one flesh. You shouldn't be uniting with another person in one flesh with whom you're already of the same kinship bond. Uh, we would say scientifically not enough differentiation in the gene pool. Right. In the case of same-sex relationships, the degree of sameness on a sexual level is actually greater than an incestuous union, not less. Uh, because uh, one's gender, uh, in here I mean in a biological sense, is a more constitutive element uh, of sex, sexual relationships than uh, is kinship. Uh, the first defining feature that we have about sexual relationships uh, has to do with a differentiation of the sexes into male and female. Incest prohibitions come later. Uh, the founding prohibition implied is the prohibition against same-sex unions, the division of male and female, so that they can then become reuni reunited into an integrated sexual whole and a sexual bond. You look at incest, yes, there's too much sameness there, but they can still procreate. Procreate is a, procreation is a key indication of being in a relationship with an appropriate sexual counterpart. Even if procreation doesn't occur, you're 
your body is organized, designed for that process. Right. Uh, but of course, in the case of a same sex union, that's not even a possibility. In the case of incest, it's a higher incidence of abnormalities from procreation. Um, and that's an indication of too much sameness. But an even greater indication of sameness is it can't even be done. You don't even have the equipment in which it can be done. So degree of severity and the justification for the prohibition, the degree of sameness, even the issue of orientation is not entirely eliminated from some incestuous bonds. There's been some discussion about uh, genetic sexual attraction for persons who are raised in separate households and then meet when they become adults, siblings that meet later when they become adults, mm -hmm. and then develop this extraordinary attraction to one another that can become sexual in some circumstances. The bottom line, it doesn't matter what a person is inwardly attracted to. Uh, innate desires are a very unreliable guide for God's will. What matters is the way in which we're structurally designed by God, that that is not as likely to be disturbed by the impact of sin in the world um, as is one's innate desires. So all that's to say is that in, in ancient Israel and early Judaism and early Christianity, there would have been a wide recognition that the closest analog to homosexual practice is incestuous practice. So here's one case where Paul actually does deal with a self-professed believer who wants to be in a sexual relationship with his stepmother. Now there's, I really, even all the, all the people say, you know, you should have the option of attending a gay wedding. That This is an equally faithful decision, and in some cases even preferable if uh, it's one of your family members that is getting married so you can stay in, in connection with them uh, and uh, uh, not lose uh, that uh, influence over their life that might be helpful at a later point. Mm -hmm. You address, if anyone addressed any of the questions, any of the uh, Ex rationalizations for participating in or attending a gay wedding and applied those same rationalizations to attending an incestuous wedding, anyone would immediately see that that's all they are, rationalizations, and they have no basis in faithfulness to God. Um, and I would hazard to say, I would guess that the people I mentioned previously who do say it's possible to attend a gay wedding, to be a faithful Christian, would not say the same thing about an incestuous union. Right. And then you'd have to ask, why is that? And I would say because of the full court press that we've had culturally for endorsing homosexual relationships, same-sex erotic relationships, people have lost a sense of the degree of severity that such relationships hold in the biblical witness. Because we don't have the same promotion of incest yet, although right. we're losing ground there and eventually there will be. First, we have to deal with, we have to do a mopping up operation here and clear up the problem of polyamory. First adopt that, then we'll go on to the incestuous relationships after that, which this is not even a slippery slope anymore because we passed we're already past those elements in the slope. Now we just have to go back and be more internally consistent and find ways of approving them if they're committed to adult unions. Um, but on the case of incest now, persons would still generally not approve attending an incestuous wedding because they recognize the severity of the offense. What I'm suggesting is from a biblical perspective, a gay wedding is even more severe and we could talk about that if you want. Yeah, time yeah and it re reminds me of, um, you know, you mentioned the slippery slope or the it's it's already, there is no slope. But um, David Berlinski, I think he once said in, in an interview that, um, you know, taboos are good for society. They help keep society together. And we've lost, the, we've definitely lost the taboo on gay weddings and gay marriage um, and homosexuality in general. But the taboos of incest and polyamory, as you say, those are soon to come. I mean, I, I don't see why they, I, I'm surprised they're not even, they're not here now. 
Yeah. So there's already, as you know, considerable promotion of polyamory. Cambridge University Press published a book recently promoting it. Um, so it's the media has been encouraging it. So an article recently about uh, we're going to have to backtrack in society with our uh, resistance to polyamory because why not? After all, if one doesn't, if one sees no particular rational basis anymore uh, for uh, prohibiting same-sex unions, then there really is no rational basis for prohibiting a polyamorous union. Mm -hmm. Because from Jesus' standpoint, we eliminate polyamory on the basis of an understanding about creation and God's intentional design in creation, that God intended um, there to be two and only two primary sexes, male and female, man and woman. And it's on that basis of the sexual binary that Jesus in Mark 10 with parallel in Matthew 19, restricts the numbers of number of partners in a sexual union, whether at any one time concurrently or serially in a revolving door of divorce or remarriage to two persons. And that number two that he fixates on uh, is only based on the two sexes. It's the sexual binary. So that if, if God is intentionally designed two and only two primary sexes, male and female, so that each constitutes half the sexual spectrum, when a male and female unite into a single sexual whole, a third party becomes neither desirable, um, neither needed nor desirable for that matter, uh, because you've already brought together the totality of the sexual spectrum. So that's what Jesus is doing in, in Mark 10. He's resolving the question of serial polygamy, a revolving door of divorce and remarriage for any cause, on the basis of appealing to God's intentional binary, sexual binary in Genesis 127 and 224. But a same-sex union says there is no need for a sexual binary in a valid sexual union. You could have two persons of the same sex, not one of each sex. Well, if that's the case, then there's no, no extrapolation of the principle of the limitation of two persons to a sexual union because the foundation on which that is based, God's intentional creation of two primary sexes, is now under assault or rejected. So, yeah, and you, yeah, and you mentioned um, back to Paul. I mean, when when he you say that Paul's actions in First Corinthians five are remedial, not punitive, and kind of can you relate that to the the idea of attending a, a gay wedding? Yes, I mean Paul. Paul doesn't want to send the incestuous man to hell. He's trying to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. His complaint about the Corinthians celebrating their ability to tolerate this behavior is a complaint based on the fact that if this man continues in a serial, unrepentant way in this practice, then he will be excluded from the kingdom of God, whether he's a genuine believer or not. And that's his whole point in the vice or offender list that he mentions twice in 1 Corinthians 5 and repeats with a few extra sexual vices in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And the extra sexual vices include men lying with a male uh, or men, soft men who actively feminize themselves to attract male sex partners. So he's correlating the two. What Paul is doing is actually recommending putting the incestuous man on church discipline. Mm -hmm. um, now, if, if it were possible to still have a dialogue with the incestuous man, where he may still come to repentance, then there would not be no need to put him on church discipline. But since he seems set on it and the community seems to be validating it to some extent, then that is the last recourse to save his life uh, and to get him to realize that once he's outside of the security of the Christian fold, he's going to be buffeted by the adversary, the Satan, Satan, and hopefully realize, hey, that was a bad move. And I need to repent of that and then come back to the full. So that, as Paul says, his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Now, attending now, it's impossible in that kind of scenario where Paul is recommending that they temporarily, as a remedial measure, 
put him outside the community because once he's engaged in that kind of behavior, he's either not a Christian or he's at high risk of being excluded from the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Either way, he can't, it can't be business as usual in the community of faith. It's not a question of being hateful. It's that you've rejected one of the irreducible minimums of the faith, at least in terms of sexual ethics here. So that's, you, you can't continue in the community with that kind of acceptance. Now, how would it even be possible for any of the Corinthians if they actually followed Paul's command here at this point? And by the way, Paul says, hey, I'm going to cast my ballot here on what to do here in the name of the Lord Jesus, right? Even though, by the way, we have no Jesus saying on man, mother, incest, much less man, stepmother, incest, right? But Paul has no doubt about what Jesus' view on the issue is. I mean, this is, this is, not, this is a no-brainer, really, to figure this out because Jesus' scriptures are so utterly clear on this. And in the case of homosexual practice, it would be even clearer, because Jesus is citing Genesis 127 and 224, which by their very nature in locking on to the male-female counterpart picture for marriage is automatically rejecting same-sex unions. So Paul can say in the name of the Lord Jesus, put this one out for his benefit, for the sake of the offender, for the sake of the church, because otherwise you're sending a signal to the church, hey, this isn't so bad after all, mm -hmm. which in the end is going to promote an array of other sexual sins, right? Doesn't mean everyone's going to immediately have incest sex, but it does mean that, look, if this guy can get away with incest, what can't we get away with? You know, pretty much, right. I guess sexual purity is no big deal. And finally, for the sake of the God who redeemed the community. I mean, God can get ticked off at this, similar to what he says about idolatry in uh, later, five chapters later in 1 Corinthians 10. You don't go to an idol's temple, even if you believe that there's no reality to the idols. You're not stronger than God, are you? Great line, great rhetorical line. It's like, you know, God has taken a lot of people out before <laughs> on the basis of sin, less than the sin that you're committing right now. But usually on the basis of two main types of sins, tolerating idolatry or tolerating sexual immorality. That's why at the beginning of chapter 10, he gives this whole exegesis about the wilderness generation. Why did hardly any of them make it to the promised land? Two reasons, idolatry, sexual immorality. And those are the two kinds of situations going on at Corinth. So is there any possibility for anyone to imagine if Paul has told the Corinthians this about the incestuous man, this is so severe as yet high risk of being excluded from the kingdom of God. You're not even to eat with such a one. How are they possibly going to go to an incestuous wedding? Right. It's not even conceivable. <laughs> There's nobody who can read 1 Corinthians 5 with any degree of, I mean, this is the most rudimentary kind of exegesis. You don't have to have a PhD to figure this out in biblical studies. Just anyone, read 1 Corinthians 5 and ask yourself whether it is remotely conceivable that if the Corinthians had come back to Paul after receiving this letter and then would have asked, oh, Paul, I, we're confused. So then is it OK then to go to the incestuous wedding between the man and his stepmother? I mean, like, what, did you not hear anything that I said? Paul would respond. I mean, it, you, you don't get it. Yeah. So if. If a gay relate gay wedding is similar, as I've argued, to an incestuous wedding in degree of severity and the rationale for rejecting it, too much sameness on the part of the participants, not enough complementary otherness, then it's quite obvious that Paul would have the same answer about a gay wedding. And then we begin to see, oh, it's not ambiguous at all in the biblical text. It would be like focus on the family or the head of Christianity today or Preston Sprinkle, or Andy Stanley, or anyone else saying, Gee, I have no idea what Paul's opinion would have been if two men had cut to, got, come together and said, Paul, could would you be, would you attend our gay wedding? I mean, it's it, it really anybody seriously think there's any ambiguity in that question? Yes, Paul would say, I would attend your wedding, even though I know that your behavior will likely lead to exclusion from the kingdom of God, we are vowing to continue in that behavior lifelong. 
Paul's going to go to the wedding. I, 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 I listen to these arguments by other Christians who are supposed to be leaders in the evangelical world. I'm not even, I'm not even listing here the left-wingers, theologically speaking, in mainline denominations. Right. I'm talking about evangelical leaders. I mean, how did we, how did we ever get to the point where something so obvious as this is now being proclaimed as an allegedly ambiguous Romans 14 issue involving matters of indifference. I mean, I, you know, I think That's I think a rhetorical Satan, question, by the way. Yeah, I know, but I think <laughs> Satan is behind a lot of a lot of it, um, and uh, you know, he's thrilled. He's thrilled to death, literally. People are being deceived, and they're largely being deceived. And again, the primary reason why people are seeing this is ambiguous, and they're not acknowledging this which is why it needs to be pointed out straightforwardly, not, not in a hateful way. I don't hate anybody who thinks differently from what I think on this issue. It's not about me. It's about let's look at the biblical text and see if we have a united, clear witness on the issue. And there absolutely is on this. And the only reason why some evangelical leaders are now suggesting there is an option is because whether or not they know it, whether or not they'll admit it to anyone else, they have changed their view on the issue of homosexual practice. Now, I'm not saying they've necessarily come to the point of saying that I affirm these relationships and it's not sin, but I'm saying they've reduced the level of severity with which that offense is regarded in scripture to a point now where they can actually say it's okay to attend a gay wedding. In other words, it's coming now virtually to the same level as a remarriage after divorce. Now, by the way, I've also written against that as well. Yeah, which we'll get, to, we'll, we'll get to the position. remarriage after divorce okay. question in a minute. Okay. But you, you say that um, in the article, you say, you may say, quote, you say, quote, you may say that you were opposed to attending a gay wedding, but your coming communicates at best that your moral stance is no big deal. Otherwise, and this is what's interesting to me, is otherwise you would be weeping for the offending family member or friend at the service and not making merry at the reception. So talk about that, because, I mean, you talk about how we should be mourning that, not celebrating, because it, it, it is an eternal situation. Exactly. That's exactly what Paul tells. And I'm not I'm not making it up myself. I'm getting this from Paul in his treatment of the incestuous man in First Corinthians five. He said, you you should rather be mourning what this guy is doing. Well, where do you mourn? The venue at which you mourn is a funeral. This guy is engaging in behavior that could get him excluded from the kingdom of God, even if he's a genuine professed believer. Now, I, what could be more serious than that? losing an eternity with God in the kingdom of God. I mean, that is the most serious thing that could possibly happen to an individual. I mean, walking out in front of a heavily trafficked highway and potentially getting hit by a car, even that, as bad as that is, is not as serious as this because we're playing for everything, all the marbles here. This is an eternity we're talking about here. So they ought to be mourning about that condition, but the reason why they're not mourning is they don't see that the issue is that serious. So if we actually responded in the way that Paul tells us we should be responding, and if we thought just a little bit about it, we would see, yes, that is an appropriate response because we don't want to see somebody excluded from the kingdom of God eternally. The whole reason for Jesus coming into the world, the whole reason for the apostolic witness of Christ is to prevent that from happening to others. That's why Jesus reached out aggressively in love to sinners and tax collectors because they were at the highest risk of being excluded from the kingdom of God. And Jesus didn't dilute the gospel in reaching out to them. He made clear, yes, even to the woman caught in adultery, Jesus says, go and from now on no longer be sinning. And that same line is used earlier in John 5, where it's followed up with, lest something worse happen to you. And the something worse happening to you in the context of John 5 is exclusion from the kingdom of God, eternal life. 
that's Jesus yeah. making that kind of warning. So if I were going to go to a gay wedding of a dear, a person dear to me, I would be in tears the whole time. I would probably be wailing. They don't, they don't want me there for that. When people go, whether or not they know it, when they go to a wedding, they're serving as witnesses to the vows that are being undertaken by the wet married couple. And those vows are to commit themselves lifelong to one another. Now, if this is founded in an immoral sexual union, then they're committing themselves to participate in an immoral sexual union that could get themselves excluded from the kingdom of God lifelong. And I'm to be a witness to that vow, celebrating that vow, and essentially committing myself to doing what I can do as a member of this proceeding to ensure that this relationship stays intact permanently. Yeah, I mean, I, I've mentioned this on the show before. I, I, I think it was about a year after I got saved. I was at dinner with two of my my two agents, and um, one of them is a gay man. Was a gay man. Is a gay man, and um, and one is a woman. And he was getting married to another man. And the woman turned to me, and we were very close friends. And she turned to me and she said, "You're going to his wedding, right?" And I, in that moment, I was so caught off guard. I was a brand new Christian. I didn't know what to say. And I was like, of course I'm going. Because I thought, oh, I'm going to just show them, you know, how loving I am. And and when I arrived at the ceremony, I was struck by how, I mean, I I wasn't expecting uh, the, the, the amount of just the feeling I had when I got there. Because everyone that was walking into the venue was you know smiling happy celebrating and i was like whoa it just just overwhelmed me that i'm here celebrating this sin and the whole night was a disaster for me personally i just and then i after that night <laughs> after that night i vowed never to go to another gay wedding i mean no one's inviting me anymore to to gay weddings at this point in my life but uh yeah, it was just it was a very strange sense of feeling and to to be at this event where everyone there is celebrating a sinful union, you know, yeah. quote, union between two men. My my older daughter was married this summer. It was a wonderful occasion. Uh, she was marrying a great guy. And, um, you know, all throughout it was celebration. Even when there was silence, there was celebration, but there yeah. was singing. There was, uh, you know, the oohs and ahs, the applause coming out after the wedding. There's the receiving line in which you're congratulating. You go on to a reception. There's toasting the couple. There can be dancing. There was dancing there. There, you're you're eating a festive meal with others. I mean, the whole event, from start to begin to finish, it says celebrate you just can't conceivably go without feeling extraordinary pressure to have to celebrate it. your very presence indicates you're celebrating this event and that is simply not possible for a christian to do and it's not only celebration it's ritualized to undergird a permanence to the union that's being formed, which would have to make you, if you saw this union as immoral, even more depressed. Mm -hmm. Now that's totally different. I'm not saying that you can't reach out to persons who are homosexually active, who are married in a same-sex union, so-called married. Of course, they're not married in God's eyes in any real sense. Definitely reach out. But in your reaching out to such persons, you're reaching out to them as though they were individual friends, not a married couple. You could right. never treat them as a married couple any more than you would treat a man and his mother as a married couple. So again, I would simply ask people, every time you, you contemplate 
what you can or should do in relationship to a homosexual union is think of what you would do in relation to an incestuous union. Right. And you, you mentioned Jesus, you know, eating with tax collectors and sinners. And that's one of the, uh, you, in the article, you talk about other excuses for attending a gay wedding and you, you say Jesus ate with sinners. So, so should I quote unquote. So when people use that argument, what's your response to that? Uh, my response would be, think of a ritual event associated both with the sexual sinners or both and or either or the sexual sinners and the economically exploitative tax collectors. Will you have fellow Jews serving an oppressive foreign power with a justly deserved reputation for collecting many more times than they were supposed to collect for the Romans and pocketing the excess for themselves and doing it to persons who are living on the economic margins and will likely starve because of what you just did. And yet Jesus is aggressively reaching out in love to them, not clearly to endorse economic exploitation. But suppose the tax collectors came up with a ritual event to celebrate their extortion of fellow Jews living on the economic margins. Does anybody seriously think that Jesus would go to such a ritual event celebrating egregious economic exploitation of fellow Jews? Does anyone seriously think that if Jesus dealing with persons in prostitution or adultery would have gone to a ritualized event celebrating prostitution or adultery? If a person cannot see that there's a difference between going to a ritualized events celebrating egregious immorality and eating a meal with somebody where such a ritualized event does not occur and doing so in the context of calling them to repentance then i i throw up my hand i mean people have lost the sense of of what analogical reasoning is all about you have to find you can't prefer remote analogies to proximate analogies. You have to go with the closest analogs, which is why I zero in on the issue of incest, because that's the closest analog we can come up with. And these other examples that I give you parenthetically about Jesus being called to such a ritualized event with either sexual sinners or with economic exploiters or tax collectors should also make pretty clear, no, he... he he would eat with them, but he wouldn't go to such a ritualized event, obviously, because Jesus would never participate in the celebration of sin. Right. That's antithetical to his entire purpose, which is to say to people, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And repent means change of mind, turn from the thing you're doing participating in a ritualized event that celebrates egregious immorality sends the exact opposite message to somebody. And therefore, as such, it cannot be a loving thing to do. Yeah. And you, you also, uh, a second kind of excuse you, you mentioned is, which we talked about briefly, but is attending the wedding of someone divorced is almost the, the excuse is attending the wedding of someone divorced is almost the same thing, right? Yeah, and my answer to that is no, because of many reasons. First of all, there are other considerations with regard to divorce and remarriage, including somebody being divorced against their will and then getting remarried. Um, but it's also the fact that that um, as bad as that may be, it, uh, it, it doesn't remotely approach the level of, say, an incestuous union or a gay wedding. It's just... It's not on the same. In other words, I know that people are operating often with the premise that scripture says that all sin is equal. That is not a biblical view. It has never been a biblical view. There's not a single person in scripture that a positive protagonist, including Jesus, who ever held such a view. And anyone who says that they hold such a view actually doesn't hold such a view. No reasonable, reasonable person has ever held such a view because we know that some sins are more egregious than others by their very nature. And again, an incestuous union, homosexual union, attack an irreducible minimum of sexual ethics. The very foundation 
in the case of homosexual practice of sexual ethics itself, on which all other sexual prohibitions are predicated, which is namely the male-female foundation. Because of the male-female foundation, we derive a principle of not being united with somebody who's already too much you. And that's the reason for prohibiting incest. It's because of the sexual binary in a male-female union that we extrapolate a limitation of two persons to a sexual union because there are only two sexual complements or counterparts to each other. So you'd be violating what is the very foundation and you can't move from some degree of accommodation to a lesser offense to accommodation to a far greater offense. Right. Having said that, by the way, I would still say if a person uh, did get uh, invalidly divorced and is attempting or invalidly divorced another and is attempting to remarry uh, to in particular, often that's the person with whom they had an adulterous relationship sometimes, uh, then obviously you shouldn't be going. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and you you mentioned this al already, but and the another excuse is if I only just attend the, the reception, but not the ceremony, because that's that that seems to be I hear that a lot from people like, well, can I just go to the reception? But as you said already, the reception is just a continuation of the celebration, if not more of, of a celebration. People are dancing, they're drinking champagne. They're like, I mean, it's more of a celebration. So yeah, exactly. You're still, yeah, you're still there. You are going to be expected to lift up your glass and a toast, celebrate with dancing, applaud. Generally, in your conversations, say good things about those who are getting married to each other and about the union and how happy you are. You can't avoid it. You're absolutely right. The venue may change from the church, but it's nothing more than an extension of what has already happened in the church. So for the very same witness, you're continuing your role as a witness who is there to do what you can in the future to make sure that this union endures. Yeah. Where actually what you would need to be doing is praying that God dissolve the union as quickly as possible. Right. And bring, and bring repentance. Right. Um, now, if then, you do want to go, I should say parenthetically, uh, Beckett, if you do want to go to the reception uh, to proclaim repentance uh, verbally, outwardly, publicly, <laughs> you might be able to persuade me. I would say it would be a little bit awkward. It would be very uh, awkward to do that. Very awkward. And I'm sure that the uh, couple would prefer that you just not even come if that's going to be your intent. But that would be about the only way you could justify going. And then uh, you say, uh, what about, you talk about this in the article, what about attending the gay wedding, quote unquote, of an unbeliever? Would that be okay? Right. And that's what some people use. They would use to reject the analogy that I give to the incest, about the incestuous man in 1 Corinthians 5, because he is a self-professed believer. Whether he's a genuine believer or not, Paul doesn't say, he says he, uh, he calls himself a brother. But later he gives an analogy in second half of 1 Corinthians 6 that suggests that he is a genuine believer with Christ in him, which makes it even worse uh, because he's involving Christ in, more, in an immoral sexual union when becoming one flesh. So what about an unbeliever? An unbeliever it doesn't have all the exact same issues, but it has enough of them to make it a problem. So a good analogy for that is the question of going to a pagan temple. Now, why would you go to a pagan temple in mid-first century Corinth? You would go to a pagan temple for any number of reasons. Uh, you could have business contacts and or family members who are inviting you to a pagan temple because pagan temples are the restaurants of antiquity. Most of the time, that's where you're going to go to eat a festive meal, to celebrate a business promotion, to celebrate a birth of a child, to celebrate a marriage. Uh, in fact, uh, in following the wedding, uh, you would expect to go to a pagan temple for further celebration of that taking place. Now, the strong and core and say, hey, we, we should be allowed to do that because we have freedom in Christ. We don't think these idols have any real existence to them. So we're not celebrating the idols, right? So why can't we go, Paul? And plus, if we don't go, we're going to hurt our businesses. We're going to hurt our family relationships. We're going to cut ourselves off from others. Same kind of arguments that people use today for attending a gay wedding. 
well, uh, Paul is quite clear, you can't go. Because even though idols, statues have no real existence, there are demonic forces behind these events. And you're essentially participating in a covenant ceremony, partnership with others in something that is egregiously offensive to God, which causes Paul to then say, again, as we noted earlier, you're not stronger than God, are you? Remember how the problems happened with Israel when Israel thought they could put God to the test. Not a good look. <laughs> you're, you're going to an idol's temple, Paul says, regardless of whether you think you're doing anything, you are. You are putting God to the test and you are coming near the flame of idolatry. Exact same thing with sexual immorality. You cannot go to an event, a ritualized celebration of, the, of an immoral sexual union, even if it involves unbelievers, because God still finds the behavior in question abhorrent. And your very presence there is still suggesting approval. Now, sometimes these people who say, you know, it's okay to go, they'll say, but you should say, like President Sprinkle will say, you should still tell the couple ahead of time. Now, you know, my view is different, and I have a traditional view about marriage, which really scriptural is what I mean, <laughs> a godly view, a view that Jesus and the apostolic witness would promote. I have that view. I just want you to know that ahead of time. Well, that's, you know, well and good for the persons that you told, although even they aren't going to accept that you have any particular commitment to that because after all you're coming to their wedding so how seriously uh, what is how serious a problem can you regard it apparently not that serious so you're conveying that to them but then what about everybody else at the wedding you didn't tell them anything right. unless you plan on getting up again when if there's some <laughs> line about if anyone objects you know speak now or forever hold your peace well if you want to do that i'd say Okay, you could go under those auspices that you would actually object, stand up and object, but they're not going to do that. And so consequently, their presence is conveying to everybody else there that this is perfectly okay. Otherwise, why would you be there? Why would you be celebrating? Why would you be right. at ritualized events celebrating it? So even if it's unbelievers, you're communicating both to the unbelievers that are involved in the union and to all others who are present there, which might also include some weak Christians who don't really know what they're doing, uh, like many of our younger generations today. Sorry to say that. I'm in my 60s now, mid-60s, and yes, I guess I have to recognize I'm getting older, but it's the younger generations that have been subjected to this full court press by the media, by the culture, uh, and their views are changing on the issue. And they could go to a wedding like that. See me, if, let's say if I attended unbelievers, same-sex unbeliever wedding, um, I would be conveying to them, it's not that big a deal apparently to me. Right. So you're sending a bad message across the board and none of that even considers, what does God think about that? Does anybody seriously think the Corinthians... I mean, not Corinthians, the Israelites are in the wilderness, in the wilderness wandering after leaving Egypt. Okay? They come across the Midianites uh, eventually, uh, or meet them, let's say, you know, en route eventually to the promised land, uh, or Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, whoever you want to put in there. And um, there's a wedding going on. Uh, and in, it, let's just call it a same sex homosexual or incestuous wedding, your choice. They really think that the attendance of Israelites in this wedding would not incur God's judgment on the community. Even if they say ahead of time, well, we don't actually agree with it, but you know, we want to be good neighbors. They really think from the perspective of the author of these texts, in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, that that would not be a problem? If they do, I would suggest flip your Bible open to the Pentateuch and begin reading, because there's no reasonable person who could argue that that would be allowable. Right. 
That's a good point. And you, well, but what do you say? Because and maybe we'll end on this, but what do you say to parents who, I mean, they're in a bind, you know, they love their child, their child. And you talk about this in the article, how it's, you know, a form of manipulation and even extortion, but often the child, you know, would say to a parent, if you don't come to my wedding, I'm going to cut this relationship off. So what do you say to parents? I mean, it's a very difficult situation to be in as a parent, I'm assuming. I mean, I can imagine. So what would you say in that to, to those parents? It would, be an, it would be a very difficult situation, as God often calls us to respond faithfully in difficult situations. It couldn't possibly be an act of love, though. Based on what you think, based on what you know, you would be affirming something in them by your very presence that could lead to their destruction, that dishonors God, that violates your conscience, that compromises the witness of God. So going is really not a possibility. And if you do decide to go, you're essentially, as you noted, setting a precedent that I can be manipulated, that I can be extorted, that I can be threatened. Look, if you don't do X, then we're not going to have any dealings with you. We're not going to visit you. You don't come here. Well, where does that end? That never ends because once you've given up the very foundation by going to the wedding to begin with, you've got nothing else that you can say. There's nothing else you can hold on and hold any scruples in the future because you've already indicated to them you're willing to attend a ritualized celebration of what they're doing. So there's you have eliminated any possibility that you can have a witness with integrity to them. And as you can't have an, a witness with integrity to them, then you've lost your ability to witness to Jesus Christ to them. You have to make clear to them, look, I, I, this is what I would say as a parent. I love you. I would give my life for you if your life were in danger. In fact, I think right now your life is in danger because of entering this union. I know that you think differently about that, but you have to understand that I'm deriving my morality here based on my Lord who gave his life for me that I might live and the entire witness of scripture surrounding him. For your sake, it would be hate for me to do what you're asking me to do because I think what you're doing is injurious to you and to others. So I cannot condone that without functionally hating you. Nor right. can I violate my conscience in the Lord. Nor can I do anything that would dishonor the one who has saved me. But I do want to continue to have a relationship with you. And I, I can eat with you, meet with you, enjoy events with you. But an event that celebrates what I have been informed by my Lord is immorality. That is a bridge that I cannot cross. And I'm hoping you'll accept that. And I'm hoping you'll see that to have a relationship means a mutual give and take. And that means you also have to respect my values and allow me to do what I can do in good conscience. And yeah. if a person can't accept that, then they've already made clear your values don't count. This is not a give and take relationship. From now on, you do everything that I want you to do because I'm holding this threat over your head. You can't have a relationship under those circumstances. That's enslavement to sin. Well, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much. We'll put the link to the article below. And thank you so much for clarifying this very difficult. I mean, it's not that difficult of an issue if, if you're faithful to the Bible, but Thank you for clarifying this. It's very, very helpful. And I think it's going to help a lot of Christians and uh, a lot of families. So thank you, Dr. Gagnon, for coming on the show. Thank you, Beckett. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you, guys. And we will see you next week.